Imagine living right next to something. Well, incredibly powerful, like a huge volcanic caldera that's, you know, been active before. It's quite a thought, isn't it? The sheer scale involved. And for people living nearby, it's obviously uh, a, a very real thing to consider. Absolutely. And today we're diving into a specific one, the Phlegraean Fields in Italy. We're looking at your sources on this, focusing on preparedness, what that really looks like according to the actual plans and data, maybe not just the headlines. Right. The idea is to sort of unpack the facts from the material you provided, try and separate that from, well, some of the noise you sometimes get around these complex natural systems. Okay, so let's get into it. The documents, mm -hmm. they say the most likely eruption is actually um, expected to be pretty small, like Monte Nuovo back in 1538. That's correct. That's the highest probability scenario. But interestingly, the planning for emergency response, it doesn't use that one. Oh. No, they use a, well, a, a more intense reference point. Something closer to the peak phase of a medium eruption, like a Stroni, maybe 4,000 years ago. They aim higher for safety planning. Okay, that makes sense. Plan for something tougher than just the most likely. And that scenario, the Astroni-like one, that's what defines the hazard zones. Exactly. That planning scenario leads to the red zone, the main danger there being those pyroclastic flows, the really fast, hot clouds of gas and rock. Nasty stuff. Very. And then there's the yellow zone where the primary hazard is significant ash fall, which can still cause, you know, major disruption and damage. Right. Now, here's something tricky with calderas, isn't it? It's not like a single mountain peak. It's hard to know exactly where a vent might pop up inside that huge area. That's a key challenge. How do you plan when the eruption source could be anywhere within a large zone? So how do the plans account for that uncertainty? Well, what the sources describe is quite clever. The hazard zones, those red and yellow areas, they aren't based on assuming just one single vent location. Uh -huh. Instead, they map out the potential impact by simulating eruptions from uh, basically all the scientifically plausible locations where a new vent could open within the caldera. So they kind of map the worst case footprint for that size of eruption, regardless of the exact starting point. Pretty much, it's a robust way to handle that spatial uncertainty for that specific medium scale event. Okay, but then there are the really, really big ones people sometimes talk about. The Campanian Ignimbrite, the Neapolitan Yellow Tuff, oh. those massive caldera forming events. What do the sources say about those? They do address them, and the material you provided is uh, quite clear that the probability of the next eruption being on that kind of enormous scale is considered very low. Very low. But why? And, I mean, how would we even know if something like that was building up? Wouldn't it just happen? Well, think about the physics. To get an eruption that huge, you need an absolutely colossal amount of magma feeding into the system very quickly. We're talking orders of magnitude more than, say, what fueled all the eruptions over a previous active period. Okay. And the documents argue that moving that much magma around underground would cause, well, massive, unmissable signals. Things the monitoring networks would definitely pick up big time. Like, what sort of signals? How big are we talking? The sources give a really striking example from the past. Before one period of activity, the ground near Monte Nuovo apparently rose by about 50 meters. Five zero. 50 meters. Wow. That's not subtle. Not subtle at all. So the point made in the planning documents is how could you have one of these super eruptions brewing without seeing that kind of major large scale ground deformation first? The data suggests you just wouldn't miss precursors on that scale. Right. So it sounds like there's a real contrast between this official planning, which is grounded in the monitoring data and these specific scenarios and maybe some of the more, uh, alarming things you might read online. The documents are quite direct on this. They state explicitly that the surveillance, the monitoring, the plans, they're based on data and quantified uncertainty. They're not based on opinions, even you know informed opinions from colleagues. So sensational headlines might get clicks. But they aren't necessarily reflecting the actual data picture, according to these official sources. And that official information, the monitoring status, the planning levels, it's all publicly available on their websites. Right now, that data points to very low probability for the huge events and suggests we'd see major warnings if that changed. Okay, so let's try and sum up this deep dive. Preparedness for the Fleegrain field isn't ignoring the risk, but it's focused planning for uh, intense phases of medium-sized eruptions. Yes, using that Astrani-like scenario. And the hazard zones account for vent uncertainty within that scenario. The truly catastrophic eruptions, mm -hmm. very low probability according to the data, and critically, they'd likely come with huge unmissable warning signs like 
tens of meters of uplift. Exactly. The takeaway seems to be trusting the ongoing monitoring and the official plans based on that data, rather than maybe um, getting swept up in alarmism that isn't data-backed. Which leads to a final thought for you. Listening. Given this difference we've talked about between how official data is presented and how natural risks can sometimes be portrayed elsewhere, how do you go about evaluating information on complex risks you come across in your own life? Something to think about.